From Kern Government Television, welcome to this week's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting, originating from the County Administrative Center, located at 1115 Truxton Avenue, Bakersfield, California. Kern County's vision is to create and maintain a customer-centered county government designed to garner the confidence, support, and trust of the people we serve. Today's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting will convene momentarily. Good morning and welcome to the uh, Tuesday, September 24th, 2019, regular meeting of the Kern County Board of Supervisors. Board to reconvene. The first item is roll call. Supervisor Gleason. Here. Supervisor Scribner. Here. Supervisor Maggard. Here. Supervisor Couch. Here. Supervisor Perez. Next item is the salute to the flag. It'll be led this morning by Supervisor Gleason. And at the conclusion of that, please remain standing for a moment of prayer, silence, or meditation, whichever you prefer. Thank you. Please join me in standing and saluting our great flag. Next item is our pet of the week, and his name is Stanley. Nick, come on out. Introduce us to Stanley. Good morning. Good morning. Pass the baton. Say hello, Stanley. <laughs> uh, good morning. Uh, Nick Cullen, Director of Kern County Animal Services. This morning's Board of the Supervisors Pet of the Week is Stanley. Stanley is about a two-year-old spaniel mix. Uh, he weighs about 12 pounds. Uh, he does shed a lot. Uh, but he's, uh, Great. <laughs> he's, a, he's a little shy uh, at first, but once you get to know him, he wants to be cuddled all the time, as county council knows. Um, so he's available for adoption this morning. Uh, his adoption fee will be just $85. He looks like he's very curious at what all these people are looking at him for. But I think uh, just the sense I get from him, the way he feels, I think he's a Tehachapi dog myself. <laughs> anyway. Reassure Stanley that they're staring now, at you, not him. I know that we had somebody that came in last week to look at Tucker. Is Tucker still there or has Tucker been adopted? Tucker was adopted that Friday. All right, cool. First day he was available, he got adopted. So I think we're seven for seven. We're seven for seven. All right, Stanley, don't let us down. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay, the next item is the uh, consent agenda. All items listed with a C, A, or a C above the item number are considered to be routine and non-controversial by county staff. We can act on those all in one motion. If there's anyone here that would like to make a comment about any of those items or ask for separate consideration of any of those items, now is the time to do that. Let me tell you what is on the consent agenda. It starts on page two, consists of items three and four and seven and eight. On to page three, items nine and 10, and then 12 through 16. Page four, items 17 through 21. Page five, items 24 through 30. And that would be that. That's the consent agenda. Is there anyone here that would like to make a comment on any of those items or ask for any separate consideration? Yep. Seeing none, I'll return to the board for a motion right. on the consent calendar. Mr. Chairman, I need to read into the record, please. Yes, sir. Um, I'm going to recuse myself on item number 28 because of a source of income to my spouse. And so I will vote on the consent calendar, but I will not be voting on item number 28. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Gleason, did you make a motion? No, sir. I just noticed that some lady oh. was coming down. I'm sorry. Ma may I you... please make a comment? You may. Uh, start. Could you start with your, give us your name, please. <clears throat> Crap. Natalie. That's an interesting comment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> did we have any beer meetings yet? Would you like to speak under public presentations or do you want to speak about a particular item on the consent agenda? Uh, on the 28 one, what happens to Prop 65? I have no idea. Are you talking about? $39,000, what? Dang it! All right. Thank you. Motion on consent. Second. Please cast your votes. Thank 
Thank you. The motion is approved. Four ayes, one absence. Supervisor Perez. Thank you. That takes us to page, back to page two under the resolutions and proclamations portion of the meeting. Item one proclaims October 6th through 12th, 2019 as National Fire Prevention Week in Kern County, and it will be presented by Supervisor Gleason. Motion on proclamation. Second. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved. Four ayes, one absent. Supervisor Perez. Morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for the opportunity to make this proclamation and presentation to our distinguished and best firefighters in the state of California. Uh, this proclamation is to proclaim October 6th to the 12th, 2019 as National Fire Prevention Week. During this week, uh, numerous activities are planned across the county and the country to highlight the importance of fire prevention both in the home and the workplace. In Kern County alone, our fire department is, is dedicated to protecting life and property by providing effective public education, fire prevention, and emergency services. And we know firsthand that they work. I mean, the remarkable work um, before the, the uh, Erskine fire saved countless lives and the education, continual drumbeat of education in the Kern River Valley has been remarkable and has changed that community for the better in so many ways and the partnership between our fire department throughout Kern County, but specifically in the Kern River Valley is um, of significant value to our uh, communities. During the week of October 6th to 12th, 2019, various activities uh, including fire prevention education booths and public service announcements will occur to raise the awareness of the citizens in Kern County. Uh, Derek, I'm going to give this to you and ask you to uh, say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Derek Tysinger, Fire Marshal for the Kern County Fire Department. Chairman Couch, members of the board, good morning. It is an honor to present before your board today regarding this important proclamation. The national theme for Fire Prevention Week this year is not every hero has a cape, plan your escape. It highlights the importance of having and practicing a home escape plan. In a house fire, you may have less than two minutes to exit your home from the time a smoke alarm sounds. Escape planning and practice can help you and those you love make the most of this time and allow everyone enough time to get out safely. Fire is just as destructive a force today as it was during the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. In 2018, fire departments across the nation responded to over 1.3 million fires. Of these, nearly 500,000 were structure fires. These fires resulted in over 15,000 injuries and 3,655 civilian deaths. 86 of these deaths can be attributed to the Camp Fire, which was the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in California history. A reason why we remember the Great Chicago Fire, one of the most famous fires in American history, is because of how it has changed the way we build our communities. Communities are now designed with fire protection in mind and people don't even realize it. Streets serve as natural fire breaks and building exteriors are much more fire resistive. Streets, excuse me. Building and fire codes are continually evolving which help firefighters keep fires confined to the building where they started when they do occur. Every October, we reinforce the importance of fire safety in order to learn from past events, prevent future tragedies, and lessen the negative impact that disasters can have on our community. Fire prevention is a team effort in the Kern County Fire Department that starts with our public education program. The Office of the Fire Marshal also plays a key role, ensuring that all new projects are engineered to meet current code requirements as well as enforcing fire and life safety standards through annual inspections. Thank you very much for this proclamation. Our firefighters, law enforcement, and other first responders protect our community, state, and nation by answering the call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor. Item two proclaims October 2nd, 2019 as California Clean Air Day in Kern County and it will be presented by Supervisor Scribner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Motion on proclamation. Second. The motion is approved. Four ayes, one absent. Supervisor Perez.
All right. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Kern County has, long, has been a long-standing and vocal advocate for clean air and healthy living. Due to our unique geography, the Central Valley faces some of the most challenging air quality conditions in the nation, requiring innovative and collaborative efforts to clean our air. On California Clean Air Day, let's all do our part by learning how to make our homes and our businesses more energy efficient, increasing our awareness of not only outdoor air quality, but indoor air quality, and challenging ourselves to utilize alternative forms of transportation. California Clean Air Day is a statewide nonprofit program built on the idea that shared experiences unite people to action to improve the health of their communities. In collaboration with Southern California Gas, Kern Green, Project Clean Air, and Kern Council of Governments will be kicking off the California Clean Air Day celebration with a free lunch and learn event on October 2nd from 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. at the station located at 7900 Downing Avenue in Bakersfield. Business owners and community leaders are welcome to join us and learn how to become a certified green business as well as receive updates uh, updated resources and information about grants and incentives. And so it is my pleasure. Um, I'm going to invite Suzanne Campbell up here, the regional uh, planner and rideshare coordinator for Kern Cog. I also have Rob Duco with us with Southern California Gas. Thanks, Rob. Um, Suzanne, I'm come up here and I'm going to present you with this certificate. So this is a proclamation the Board of Supervisors of the County of Kern State of California has officially proclaimed October 2nd, 2019 as California Clean Air Day in Kern County. And this recognition has been entered into our official minutes, signed by our Honorable Chairman, David Couch. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Thank you for your efforts. <laughs> Thank you. Bet. Thank you. And if I may, I'd like to introduce Brenda Turner with Kern Green and Carlos Bello also with um, the Asthma Coalition of Kern County. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to say a few words about California Clean Air Day. When it comes to air pollution, we can all do our part. Whether you're an individual, a business, government agency, or nonprofit organization, there are many things we all can do to improve our air quality and protect public health. In a region with some of the worst air pollution in the United States, it's imperative that we work together to help improve our air quality. Proclaiming October 2nd as California Clean Air Day shows that the County of Kern is committed to join forces with other cities and counties throughout our state to create new habits that will help clear the air for all of our communities. We're excited to be kicking off this great event with the Green Business Lunch and Learn on October 2nd, where various businesses and agencies will be joined together to learn how to become a true green business. October 3rd, CSUB is extending the California Clean Air Day celebration with a tree planting at their new edible garden at 6 p.m. that evening. And on October 5th, Saturday, the Asthma Coalition of Kern is hosting a Clean Air Day camp at Valley Verde Elementary School. And how convenient for us to continue the practice of clean air by following these events with Brideshare Week, the week of October 7th through the 11th. Kern Transit, our local bus service, is going to be assisting Commute Kern, a rideshare service provided by per Kern Council of Governments, by hosting a ribbon cutting of their new electric, beautiful buses as a kickoff for Rideshare Week. Since transportation is the single biggest source of our air pollution in California, encouraging people to consider alternate means of transportation is a great way for us to establish new habits that are healthy for us all. We ask that all county representatives and staff make the clean air commitment by taking the pledges at cleanairday.org. We look forward to continuing our work with the county at improving our air quality. And we thank the Board of Supervisors and the County of Kern for your continued support of these types of events. We've placed flyers for each event in the back of the room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That takes us to item five, public presentations. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the board on items that are not on the agenda but are under the jurisdiction of the board. Is there anyone here that would like to make a public presentation? Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Mary Bedard, Registrar of Voters. 
Today is National Voter Registration Day, and we'd like to encourage everyone who is eligible to vote but not yet registered, or who want, needs to update their voter registration information, or who wants to change their party preference, to go to our website at kernvote.com to register or for more information. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bedard. Good morning, how Good morning. are you? Good morning. Thank you for having uh, me here this morning to have the opportunity to speak before the board. My name is Laura Reyes. I'm here representing home care providers with United Domestic Workers. As you know, right now we are in contract negotiations. I would like to encourage the board to please consider giving these folks a living wage, as well as including health insurance. And while some of us have the luxury of having health insurance, others in this county do not and people are really struggling to make ends meet. And when you are caring for someone, a loved one with severe dis disabilities, that often pre uh, prevents you from going outside the home to look for other employment. And so while these people are just struggling to get by, they need to be healthy themselves. And we all know that home care providers save the state of what it would cost to institutionalize folks. So here these providers are trying to uh, maintain their households, take care of their clients, to let them live healthy and happily in their homes. And meanwhile, they too themselves need home uh, health care. So I'm asking you to please consider giving us a fair uh, living wage, a fair contract, and health insurance. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Reyes. Who will be next? Good morning, Chairman Couch, members morning. of the board. Um, thank you for, for your time. Uh, my name is Wyman Johnson, W-Y-M-O-N, first name, last name, Johnson. Um, I'm the District of Five Vice Chair for United Domestic Workers Union, and I'm just here to, to more like touch on what Laura just mentioned. Um, it's contrary to what people believe. It's it's very hard being a health care provider. Um, um, I was provided for my brother for eight years, and he recently passed away. And in, in that time, it was more, I, I, I put him, his health needs before mine. So in the absence of him passing, I was able to, um, I had a little bit of time to get, take care of myself. So I found out that I had a health issue that I didn't even know existed. And I, it, it was, um, because I it waited so long, it was like, it, it got to almost be life threatening. So um, not having health insurance, it, it, it's, it's really, you know, it's really, um, it really makes it tough um, for providers like myself. Um, um, and so I just wanna echo what Laura said, um, just ask you to consider a fair living wage and health insurance um, for providers. Um, and thank, I thank you for your time. Um, so. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Okay. Good morning. My name is Raina Jacobo, and uh, this is, yes, Jacobo, J-A-C-O-B-O. -O. Okay, um, this is my son, Jonathan, you know, who I care. He's 25 years old, but he's my baby. The reason why is because his mentality is at seven, eight years old. Um, it's very important that we have health coverage. Um, you know, God forbid something was happened to me. I can't afford, I live pay to by paycheck. I, I would not afford to pay those bills. Um, I need to be in good health. Excuse me, kind of nervous. This is the first time. Don't be. <laughs> um, to ever to provide the quality care, the lovely care for my son. Um, he really relies on me 24-7. Um, and thank you very much. Can you give us your first name again? Reina, R-E-Y-N-A. Thank you. Sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, my name is O.C. Crawford. I'm with the True Love Tribe. And uh, you've been seeing me quite a bit because of the event that's coming up. And uh, I know that all of you will be present since we will be presenting uh, the Board of Supervisors uh, with the award for their great uh, service to the community. And uh, our theme is we're making 
uh, Kern County the best county in America because of our supervisors, our mayors, and the incredible citizens that we will also be honoring at this event. This is a public event, it's not uh, political, but we're gonna have some political people there, but it's a family event for community, bringing unity in the community. So I'm here to just one last time uh, <clears throat> remind everybody <laughs> uh, that we hope to see your face in the place. And also I was wondering if, um, I have some flyers. I was wondering if I could leave some on the back. Sure. Uh, for people, because many people are here are somewhat civic minded. A lot of people that I know aren't, and it's like pulling teeth to get them to see the value of doing the types of things that, that you guys are doing and what we're doing. So uh, thank you, and again, you won't see me for a while. Have a good day. Mr. Crawford, you come down anytime you want. Ask your question. Well, thank you. So, hang on one second, Supervisor. Sure. Sir, when is the event again? Uh, Saturday, this Saturday, uh, 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock, one hour. Very good. Thank you very much for the honor. And I'm, I'm going to travel to see my grandson, uh, and I won't be here this weekend, but thank you very much for the honor and, and uh, thinking of us. You're quite welcome. And by the way, there is free food. <laughs> oh, well, we might change our mind now. <laughs> Maybe my grandson can wait a week. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Crawford. Any other speakers this morning? Yes, ma'am. First and foremost, I would like to thank all of you for your due diligence and your service to our community. It's not an easy task. Quit crying, dumb bitch. Um, so I read a report that 80% of our homeless people are here in California. It's a damn shame. That is unacceptable on every level. They can't keep shipping them into our community and thinking that we're gonna resolve the problem. So how do we end it? Budgetary, socioeconomical, whatever. People have to register to vote or they should be ashamed of themselves, in my opinion. Your opinion is like a <sighs> Anyhow, so back to the task at hand. Um, they ask us to pay a lot of money and everybody throws money at it, but it's not getting resolved. Gotta freaking get in and get dirty, you know? That's all I have to say. Thank you. And good morning. Good morning. Have a good day. Awesome. Good morning. Good morning. Chairman Couch, Supervisors. My name is Dustin Alkire. I'm the president of KCDOA, Kern County Detention Officer Association. Last week, I spoke before this board and announced KCD's, KCDOA's support for Sheriff Youngblood and District Attorney Zimmer for their ongoing efforts to find a resolution for this homeless epidemic. Homelessness, property crime, theft, and drug abuse are rising to levels never seen before in Kern County. Law enforcement's hands are tied. Individuals are arrested for these crimes and released with a promise to appear in court when we have empty jail beds. Our minimum facility barracks and mega barracks are all empty. Our maximum facility is housing less than 100 inmates when it has a capacity for more than 400. We do not have enough detention deputies to get the job done. In response to Supervisor Perez's question last week, as detention deputies with the Kern County Sheriff's Office, we sit 24.5% behind comparable counties throughout the state. We are 24.5% out of market when it comes to attracting new detentions deputies. This is a significant contributor for the high turnover rate we see. In response to Supervisor Maggard, we do appreciate the F-STEP that provided an additional 5% to detention deputies across all ranks when they started their sixth year on the job. However, this July after that F-STEP became effective, we still continue to lose detention deputies at an alarming rate. This is a crisis, it affects all of us. 
We have people on the streets that should be in jail. We have beds to be able to put them in, but we don't have detention deputies available to work those posts. Sheriff Youngblood is doing all he can to recruit and hire, but it's hard to recruit and retain the staff we currently have when the pay is not there. We need your help. Thank you for your time, supervisors. Thank you. Any other public statements today? Good morning, Chairman Couch, members of the board. My name is Chris Ashley, and I'm the secretary for the Kern County Detention Officers Association. I'm here today representing the detention deputies of the Kern County Sheriff's Office. Recently, District Attorney Cynthia Zimmer stated that there are 1,000 empty beds at the Laredo jails. Sheriff Donnie Youngblood and District Attorney Zimmer have both recently expressed the imminent need to reopen these empty beds at the Laredo jails. KCDOA agrees that these beds should be opened, but this cannot happen without addressing the recruitment and retention issues facing the detention deputies. The County of Kern has lost more than 75 detention deputies in the past 20 months. Roughly 30% of the entire detention deputy workforce has left the Kern County Sheriff's Office in less than two years. Since the beginning of 2018, more than 20 Kern County detention deputies have walked away from their careers to seek employment in other law enforcement related jobs. Kern County detention deputies are roughly 24 and a half percent behind our comparable agencies and counties in compensation. We cannot continue to operate like this. Board, I am asking you to please address this public safety crisis. Give your detention deputies a new contract that will help us to recruit and retain our good employees. Open these 1,000 empty beds at the Laredo jails and we, the detention deputies, will continue working to enhance the safety, security, and quality of life to the residents of Kern County through professional public safety service. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other comments this morning? Seeing none, we'll go to item five, which is board member announcements and reports. Seeing none there, we'll go to the next item, which is item 11. It is uh, under the uh, Employer's Training Resource Division, uh, Education and Workforce Development presentation, really about Bakersfield College Early, uh, the Early College Initiative. Mr. Stevenson. Chairman, board members, good morning. Morning. Before I introduce Bakersfield College and their early education program, I need to take a step back for a minute. On September 17th, your board issued a proclamation declaring September National Workforce Development Professionals Month in Kern County. I publicly want to thank the board for this presentation, this proclamation, and accept it on behalf of all the great employees and staff that are working in workforce. I also want to send a special thank you to Supervisor Maggard for his presentation and his understanding. Thank you. Bakersfield College Early College, Early College Education and Workforce Development presentation is going to be given by three different members. In April, you heard a presentation from other members from Bakersfield College talking about the program in McFarland. This is the same type of program, but a different emphasis on high tech and working with the high school students and getting them some college classes while they're still in high school. They're here today to make a presentation about that program. I'm gonna turn it over to Abel and we'll hear the Bakersfield College presentation. Abel. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Abel Guzman, Executive Director of Rural Initiatives for Bakersfield College, uh, essentially covering all the areas in our rural communities um, that Bakersfield College serves. I'd like to start by recognizing a few individuals uh, uh, who support the work of Early College at Bakersfield College, particularly our current community college district, uh, Trustee Romeo Agbalog, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. I'd also like to recognize Supervisor Perez, uh, who along with Mr. Michael Turnipseed made the Game Changer grant possible in 2015 to focus this early college work at Arvin High School. 
And last but not least, our awesome early college team uh, who focuses in Arvin. We have Andy Grohava, Program Manager, Rural Initiatives, who is the driving force behind this work. We have Tania Burgos and Maggie Rodriguez, who are our educational advisors made possible by this grant uh, from ETR out in Arvin High School. Before we show a video where uh, our partner, Principal Ed Watts at Arvin High School is gonna break down the program, I wanna give a little context of where we came from with this grant that was made possible in 2015. This grant really was a catalyst for what early college is. You all heard from, from some of our partners uh, with what we're doing in McFarland. Um, this is a, a, this grant, this Game Changer grant, really was a game changer. Uh, we piloted this program in Arvin High School and now it's in every high school in rural Kern County and we're coming into the Bakersfield community to, to, be, uh, to Kern High School District to offer this program. It's been a catalyst, not just for the early college model, but it's been a catalyst also for Bakersfield College to seek out other funding opportunities to move this work. Uh, as a college, we're always looking for grant opportunities. Uh, in the last five years, we've gone from $9 million to $30 million in grant opportunities to help us move this work. And we're about moving, we're about moving the work. And so when we received this grant in 2015, we started offering classes within one semester for high school students. And we wanted to look at what what would it look like for high school students to take college classes during the regular school day, as well as after school concurrently, to gain or to earn a substantial amount of college credits by high school graduation? Our goal was that they could knock out at least one year of college in high school. And we're on track to do that thanks to our, our awesome team here. And so the grant uh, is set to expire here in the next year. We have been fortunate enough to leverage different funding to extend that uh, and really be fiscally conservative with that grant. And so we're hoping with your blessing to continue doing this work for at least another two years through the grant. Uh, but that's just through the grant. We as a college are committed to the community of Arvin, the community of Delano, McFarland, Wasco, and Shafter, um, as well as Bakersfield uh, with the Kern High School District. So with that, I'd like to, uh, I believe we have a video queued up that it's gonna explain the, the program a little bit more. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen board members, distinguished guests. My name is Ed Watts, I'm the principal of Arvin High School and I'd like to take a minute to um, talk to you about the partnership between Bakersfield College and Arvin High School. We have a wonderful program um, right now called the Game Changer, which absolutely is a game changer. So the Arvin High model, our goal was to select 60 students per year to participate in our Game Changer program. We currently have two cohorts that are in the model with a third coming on board in this, this spring. We created a pathway for these students to complete 30 to 45 um, concurrent enrollment college credits. The students commit to taking one class after school for three hours a week for 16 weeks. Each course they take is CSU UC transferable and helps them meet their general ed requirements in either one of the systems. Now I'd like to show you an example of, of the Game Changer model. This pathway was built with the CSU UC model in mind to where all of the courses are transferable into that model. I currently have two cohorts in the pathway and I want to give you an idea of how they're doing as far as gaining college credit. It's the first cohort, I have um, 58 students in that cohort, which the majority of them are eight credits and above with my one rock star um, with 19 college credits entering into their junior year. Um, the second cohort, which are now sophomores, there are 53 of them in the model with the, the top uh, performers in the nine college credit realm all the way down to three. But the even more exciting for the parents and for, for us here in building out this program is the amount of money that each student is actually saving in tuition and fees and books. So I'd like to show you an example of how we're doing. We have nine students that have earned 18 college credits. So if you take into consideration that they've saved somewhere in the neighborhood of $828 in tuition and $102 in fees, just in tuition and fees alone, those students are ahead $930. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that these students are all gonna be college bound. They're all gonna be reaching um, for a successful future because of this opportunity. But without this partnership, our students would be, wouldn't be afforded this wonderful opportunity that they have. So my hope, my prayer is that you, know, you strongly consider and you take into consideration the information that's presented before you 
and I know that I'm biased, but very much so would appreciate if this grant would continue to go forward and we would be able to continue this model to show the county what a, a public high school of 2,700 kids can do given partnerships and given the opportunity. Thank you. And I would like to make just one final comment. As I was walking in this morning and the officer that was checking me in uh, asked what I was presenting on, I explained and, and he mentioned he was an Arvin High alumni and, and really wished that this program was around when, when he was there. And for a community that has a 2.2 uh, back a bachelor degree attainment rate, this really is a game changer. And so we thank uh, all of you on behalf of Bakersfield College and, and um, the current high school district for making this possible. 2.2% baccalaureate degree attainment rate. So this, we're hoping to move the, the needle on that with, with this program. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to make a public comment on the presentation, this item? Seeing none, uh, board members? I don't hear any, and the, the uh, requested action is just to hear the presentation. So. I heard an ask in there though, and that was for the an extension of a grant or at least our support of that. Can we just refer that to you, Mr. Alsip? Thank you. I think that takes us over to item 22 under public health services. It's a request to set a public hearing Could you consider a proposed ordinance amending section 8.04.150 of the Kern County Ordinance Code related to unpermitted food vending. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, one of the core functions of public health is to ensure the protection of our food supply. Public health issues um, permits and conducts routine inspections at more than 4,000 food facilities and more than 500 mobile food facilities. To prevent the transmission of pathogens in our food supply, we work with restaurants and markets to ensure they are utilizing sound food safety practices. Unfortunately, there are a number of mobile food vendors that operate throughout the county without first obtaining a health permit, and more importantly, operate in an unsafe and unsanitary manner that presents a risk to the public. The department works diligently in response to this issue, uh, providing education and at times enforcement after hours and on the weekends. However, we're still challenged with bringing about sustainable change and we, we remain concerned about the risk for disease transmission and that risk remains high. To help highlight the issue, I have just a few pictures I'd like to show you from the last two months where we've sent out inspectors after hours, and I'd just like to talk to them uh, just briefly. So if we could show those. So these are pictures that show uh, what we call potentially hazardous foods. So they are meat-based um, foods that are left out of temperature. And when foods are left out of temperature, pathogens can grow and people can get sick. From uh, tongue, beef tongue on the left, to uh, chicken in the middle and a marinade on the right. Uh, this has just been found outside. Uh, these are 100 degree days, really hot, and the food's just sitting out of temp. Uh, again, different types of food. Uh, um, crickets on the left, dried fish uh, on the other side of the picture. Um, again. There's no protection, the food's left out of temperature, presents a food safety risk for anybody that consumes. And not, yeah, not knowing where they come from. Again, uh, some more pictures of uh, meat that is left out of temp, kind of covered into the side uh, when the inspector showed up. Again, presents an immediate food safety risk um, to the public. <clears throat> and the vehicles that sometimes are used are obviously uh, present a concern they're unsanitary. Um, clearly, we're concerned about temperature control and just general sanitation. Uh, different types of setups. Uh, here you see uh, some cooking equipment uh, on, the, on the left and then some just general tables that have been set up on the right. 
utensils uh, that's not, they're not cleaned, equipment that's not cleaned, kind of dirt on the ground. Again, some general sanitation concerns we have. Once more, um, different types of cooking outdoor that is not allowed. Uh, we're worried about if utensils are used to cut up meat and they're left out for extended periods of time. There's no covering for insects or dirt. Um, and a lot of times we just don't even know actually what it is, which you can see on the top right. Again, just different places that we have come across in the last two months. Um, just things are in disarray. The, we're worried about cross-contamination. Uh, food sitting on the ground presents some general sanitation risks. Uh, these are tamales um, left out at temperature. Uh, they will grow pathogens. Um, we don't know where they're prepared. We don't know how they're served. Um, significant risk for the transmission of disease. And again, different types of meat that we've observed out in the field. Um, again, most importantly, we're not maintaining temperatures. They're not cold or they're, or they're not hot. So those pathogens that we hear about, like salmonella and shigella, can grow in these environments. Um, the one on the left is a fruit cart uh, without any temperature control or any hand washing ability. And then the other three pictures of just meat uh, in different states that are left out of temperature. Again, uh, a fruit cart. Um, the fruit is oftentimes cut up uh, out in the field um, and they have no way to wash hands. There's no good temperature control. You can see the water leaking out the bottom. And again, another fruit cart that's not permitted. Uh, we're pointing out uh, the mold that is growing in the bottom uh, where the food comes in contact with. This is interesting too. These are two different locations, but uh, they are cooking uh, what appears to be beans in a pot and then they're storing them out of temp. So that's an issue again, where you're holding food outside of the um, refrigerator or hot holding. But even more importantly, these are non-approved utensils. So that is um, that, that style of pottery, we have some strong concerns about imparting lead into the food. That glaze that is often used um, will actually add a high level of lead to the food. So we of course don't allow that in a permitted food facility. That's it. So currently our process is to work with any unpermitted food vendor with the ultimate goal of trying to assist them with coming into compliance and ensuring protection of the food. Uh, we even have a weekly established date and time that we have in, uh, inspectors available to meet and to work uh, with the vendors. If our educational outreach is unsuccessful though, state law allows for the help inspectors to issue a notice of violation and to require the vendor to discontinue sales. Depending on the imminent food safety risks, the inspector may also recommend the disposal uh, of any food that has been handled in an unsafe manner. And if after several unsuccessful attempts to remediate this food safety risk, we will actually issue a citation for operating without a permit, which is a misdemeanor under state law. Surprisingly though, at times, um, these actions still have failed to bring about changes. Due to these ongoing challenges, the grand jury now in two consecutive reports, one in 2018, and then most recently in June of 2019, recommended the creation of an ordinance that would allow for the temporary impoundment of equipment with administrative financial penalties for food vendors operating without a health permit. So after a review of ordinances and programs from several other California counties and a site visit and ride along with Fresno County, we have drafted a proposed ordinance uh, for your review. This ordinance will allow for the impoundment of the cart and cooking equipment that is used in the sale uh, of unpermitted food and following uh, several previous documented attempts to bring about change. The equipment then can be reclaimed by the owner after the fees for the cost of the impoundment are paid. Although the action that we are seeking today is just to set the public he hearing for October 22nd, we felt it was important to provide a brief review of the topic today. And I also want to acknowledge two local business owners that have been instrumental in bringing about this uh, issue up repetitively and have provided guidance uh, in the development of this ordinance. 
Alex Ruiz, who owns our local La Mina restaurants, and Norma Diaz, the owner of La Rosa, are both in the audience today. And I think they both have uh, some comments to, to make during public comment. Both Alex and Norma understand the food safety risks that are presented by unpermitted food vendors, but have also strong concerns about the unfair business advantage that is provided by this. And finally, it, it's, it's, it's nice to note that Kern County is just an amazing place where we can identify an issue that needs help. We work with our local business owners, we get together, we develop a solution, and we create a solution that creates a healthier and safer environment for our community. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. Is there anyone here that would like to make a comment on this particular item? This would be the time if the uh, Ms. Rojas or Mr. Ruiz would like to. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? How are you? Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'm doing well, thanks. My name is Norma Diaz. I'm the owner of La Rosa Fruit Bars and Ice Cream, a Bakersfield-born business coming into its 40th year. Um, thank you for allowing us a voice today that's literally yearned to be heard for, <laughs> I, I, I want to say decades, at least two. Today we're asking for your approval on the ordinances being presented, put together by our proactive health department and backed by many food business owners. I believe it's way past time to take back the public health of our communities and to help our legal businesses thrive as they should be able to. This ordinance is a long time coming and we're at the threshold of a decision, your decision. For many years, my business has suffered by the long time crisis of illegal street vendors. It has stolen profits from our business owners and revenue from our city and county. I believe we all have opportunities However, we run our businesses according to the laws of our city and county. None of this law and order is being met with respect by these illegal food vendors. Every day I drive down the streets and find illegal fruit vendors. In my case, naturally, it stands out seeing I manufacture frozen fruit bars. However, the same goes with the many illegal taco stands, mostly all over the east side and other outlying communities, our communities. I live on the beautiful east side, so I, I see this every single day. All we've been allowed to do is give a slap on the wrist and make them aware they cannot be doing this without the proper license and permits. At this time, we get to remove their food items, yet tomorrow, here they are again doing the same thing at the same corner or on different corners, and it's absolutely unacceptable. The health inspectors out enforcing the laws are getting laughed at and disrespected knowing we can't do anything else besides throw some food away. Some inspectors being verbally abused and even threatened. Down in LA County, the problem is so severe they've thrown their hands up in surrender. I'm afraid we're heading down the same road if we don't take a stronger stance to eradicate this problem. We need to set an example that it can be done for the number one reason, public health. Why can't Bakersfield be that city that takes the measures to solve this problem by thinking outside the box? The proposed ordinance will help us get started down this road to recovery once and for all. Literally, the health of Bakersfield and Kern County are at risk. So we propose now not only removing their food products, but also allowing them ample opportunity to get their affairs in order, to do things properly by giving them two chances before their equipment is impounded. So in closing, I ask you, the board, to please pass this ordinance so we can finally take real action in keeping our public health safe. Thank you for your thank, time. Thank you, Ms. Diaz. You wouldn't know it, but she and I went to high school together. Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> she sounded so happy about that moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> the years have been kinder to her. Good morning. Good morning, uh, gentlemen of the board. How are you doing today? Um, my name is Alex Reese. I'm uh, uh, partners in uh, La Mina Cantina. Me and my brothers and my father own, uh, own the, uh, the chain of restaurants. And uh, some of other family members, all, we also own uh, Bootleggers and uh, Fresco Grill, which one of my brothers here to talk about Fresco Grill also. So we've been in business since uh, 1986 in the Valley, in San Fernando Valley. We moved over here in 1993, opened our first restaurant in Arvin. After that, we 
got into, into opening restaurants in Taft, Lamont, Bakersfield. And uh, since then, we've uh, sold uh, some of them, but we currently have about, uh, about four minas. And um, I've never really got involved in politics or changing of codes or the enforcement of certain codes or whatever. They've told me you should run for office or what have you. I said, ah, I'm pretty happy where I'm at. I'm, I'm <laughs> sure, I'm sure you got to be, you have to be a special breed to run for office. <laughs> and uh, so I, um, but now it got to the point where it's getting out of control. I see, uh, I see it every day, all around. Uh, it's just something that uh, is something that, I mean, realistically, I don't even know why I'm here. Uh, this shouldn't, this to me, this shouldn't be going on. I've seen it all my life in Mexico when my when my parents have t taken me to Mexico. We see all the problems over there with the, the the cleanliness of the food, with this and that. And now I'm seeing it here, so I'm thinking, what what the hell? I used to just go to Mexico to see it, and I I enjoy eat, like eating from from the the vendors, even even the legal ones here. I I, I eat some uh, from the vendors also. In Mexico, we go to the horse races in Mexicali. My 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 uncle has some horse uh, and races them. The, the food vendors over there, me and my dad were sitting down watching them do business, and it's awful. We, we, we got a little inside joke saying that if the health department here could go to Mexicali and see what we just saw in the horse, in, in the horse races, they'd have a heart attack. But guess what? Now we're seeing it here. We're seeing it all over the place, not, not just a couple of places. Before it was couple of places, oh, I never bothered calling and reporting. I'd feel like, a, like what they would say, like a rat, you know, ratting people out. Not my style. But now it's not just about me. It's, funny. it's kind of like changing the culture of the United States. Never did I see this coming. Not in a hundred years did I see that people could sell illegal food in the, on the streets and at their houses. To me, it's puzzling. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's not what, it's not, I was the first of, our, of the family to be born here, you know, uh, so I take pride in that. And I, I kind of like the, um, the contrast of being here and being able to go to Mexico whenever I wanted and, and, and see what's going, the culture and how they do the tacos and all that and bring that back here, but in a safe manner. But now I see the guys are just not doing it safely. They're, 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 they're promoting these foodborne illnesses. And one of the things that we might not hear about people getting sick all the time, mostly because they're Hispanics going to these places because they're run by Hispanics, so they bring the Hispanic community to them. And we're not the kind of people that be like, oh, you know what, let's report him, let's report him, or I got, I got sick and I go to, go to the hospital. I could tell you that's for sure because my, my son went to a, a, a seafood restaurant here locally, or, or I mean, legitimate seafood restaurant, got sick, like really bad, went to the emergency room, was bad for four days. He says he doesn't want to touch seafood ever again. And then I thought, while I was sitting here, we never reported it. And he's, I mean, he's second generation American already. But that Hispanic side of us, we just didn't report it. And, and so that's why you guys are probably not hearing it. And that's another thing. I mean, it'd be nice for me to be some kind of a watchdog to also take care of some of the Hispanic people or, you know, look after them a little bit. They get sick, they're not gonna report it, they're not gonna say nothing about it. They'll go, to, they'll go in their bathroom and handle it however they need to handle it, and they'll go maybe to the clinic or something, but they won't, say, they won't call the health department and say, hey, you know what, this is happening. So it's a shame, like I say, don't know why I'm here. I mean, don't know how we got to this, but, but we're here. Sometime back, um, well, brick and mortar buildings like us or lunch trailers, we got a lot of expenses, a lot of expenses. We pay, uh, we pay, um, we pay our mortgage. We pay uh, our rent. We pay building insurance, liability insurance, sales tax, workman's comp, EDD, FUTA, PG&E, gas, phone, internet, uh, credit card fees, advertising fees, health department fees, alarm permits, CO2. A new law with CO2. Now that we got to comply, it's costing us say a thousand, maybe a little bit more than a thousand dollars. Backflow devices for the health department, which that backflow uh, device alone costs $1,200. $1, we pay all of these stuff. What do, they, what do the legal vendors pay? Propane. That's it. 20 bucks to fill a tank of propane. And here we go. Do it all. And then it affects us, the brick and mortar buildings. Now, Walmart goes into a place and people start crying out um, that uh, it's going to affect the, the, the urban decay. It's going to affect all the smaller, rest, the smaller uh, stores. Urban decay, urban decay. Well, I kind of see it happen here. 
How long will it be for those, for those places to put us out of business? As it is, we're already in a really, really thin uh, profit margin. I mean, the 2008 crisis, we surfed through it. Me and my family, luckily, we surfed through it. We were, we were fine. Now, not so good. Now we're looking to change, uh, change um, professions. We, my brother just opened, he's part of our restaurant business. He just opened a restaurant supply. Why? Because maybe it's better just to sell to them instead of trying to make money off of the, off of the customers because it's just getting to the point where business is not as good as, as, good as it was before. Why? Maybe it's because all these illegal vendors selling out, selling out of their, the, the streets and their houses. That's crazy. My, uh, we got we ranches that, that, that do it on the weekends or even during the week we got people, before it was after five and on the weekends so they won't get caught by the health department. Now they're, they're pretty bad. Now it's during the week. Now it's uh, not even nine to five at uh, any day. Now it's because they know nothing's gonna happen. And in the past, nothing has happened. I've pushed with, uh, with Matt to let's, let's solve this problem, let's solve this problem. I, I started pushing maybe about a year ago when I saw that it was all going crazy. I, I, I went to him when I heard that the law had, the, had passed that people could uh, cook out of the house. Me being the business owner, I thought they really could, could cook it out of the house. Now I went to Matt, he, ex he explained to me, no, that he really can't, there's, there's certain limitations. People don't know that. People think, the people in the ranch is having, you know, 30, 40, 50 people show up to eat the birria, the barbacoa, the tacos, the carne asada. They think they're, they're within, within the law because somebody signed a paper saying that it's okay to cook from your houses and sell at the house. Well, they're not educated uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the law, and, but it doesn't matter, still the damage is done. They're doing the damage to themselves, to, the, to their customers, and to us. I got, a, I got a high school friend. I'm from the Valley, the San Fernando Valley. We're born and raised in Silmar. Got a high school friend. Got, uh, he, still, he still lives over there. Got some multi-million dollar. Eh? No, no, I, I feel weird. You know, I can't be, I'm pressured now. Now I'm pressured. Well, he's a high school friend. He lives in the Valley, multi-million dollar house. That's, that's, uh, that's my brother. So, um, so he lives in a multi-million dollar house. I went to go visit him eh, maybe three months ago. While I'm getting to his house, I see the house next to him has a big old, uh, has a big old open sign that says tacos. I'm like, wow. So I talked to him. He goes, yeah, he goes, ever since he signed the new law, people are just putting he, And this is right next door to him. And he's in the multi-million dollar house. He's, and this is in Silmar. This is not just a little rinky-dinky house in a, in a low, low, uh, um, in a low income community. This is a multi-million dollar house. And uh, right next door, he got to ra they got ranches all over the place. And right next door, they're selling. He goes, that's not noth that, that's nothing. He goes, on the weekend, there's another three houses that open up. We're talking about this is a nice, uh, good community. And now they're selling tacos next door? I mean, I live in a nice house. I'm assuming you guys live in a nice house, a nice neighborhood. How about your neighbors start selling tacos? That's, that's where you're like, wow, we got to do something about it. That's where I'm at. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Could you all do me a favor and leave your contact information with Mr. Alsop over there? Will do. Just for me. Thank you. Good morning, morning. Chairman of the Board and members. I promise it won't be uh, as long as Alex. I thought maybe you were coming up with a hook. He's, he said everything <laughs> I wanted to say, so I'm going to just go from the heart. After a normal presentation, um, really uh, think you guys get the message. My name is Sergio Aguilar, and I'm here on behalf of Fresco Mexican Grill and Catering. My brother, my brother Pedro, we also have other representatives here. There's Art, the guy that opened up the, um, the warehouse. Alex mentioned that's his brother. We have La, Las Islitas, Mexican food here, Mariscos. So it's a problem for us. Uh, like Alex mentioned, we have a lot of expenses. Uh, among us, we don't see us as competitors. If anything, they are fair competitors. It's really unfair to compete against someone that has all the advantages, no license, no taxes, uh, no women's comp. So we went to a presentation about two years ago. And thank you, Matt, for uh, bringing this subject on to the board and doing what you have done. We spoke to Matt and uh, we presented to him all the problems we're having and the unfair competition. So I'm very happy to be here today and seeing some type of solution for this problem. Uh, as I drive down Chester Avenue on Friday nights, I see 10, 15 vendors that are taking our customers when we pay $7,000 rent, when we have all these expenses, it's really hard to make it in this uh, business. So we do everything legit. 
and we get, I'm sorry, but I have to say that we get slapped by the health department because we have five degrees above the normal temperature. Uh, they post us on TV. There's restaurants that have a, a problem. They come out on TV, come out on the, comes out on the news, but the news should be really chasing those people and not us. We're doing everything legitimately. Uh, we have hundred. I'm actually from Cuba. My, my, my uncle came from Cuba a few years back, and he thought how great it was to have a business. And when I showed him everything else, uh, all the permits that we have to go by, he said it's worse than communism. That's what, that was his comment. Everything we have to follow. So you get the message. Please pass this ordinance so we can have fair competition among ourselves, and that's something so unfair that we're facing today. And this is not us. We have uh, Salty's Barbecue. We had like 25 people at the health department last meeting. They're not here today. Unfortunately, they, they have to work to make a living. Uh, we're going from, from here, we're going to work, you know, our butt off all day long. We thank you for your support. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar. Any other comments? I want to add another Second bite at the apple. That's okay. <laughs> What's that? Second bite at the apple. <laughs> yeah. I want to add a little, a, little, a little story that happened. It was interesting. And this reflects on how all our friends feel. We got, a, we got a, an organization, uh, an unofficial uh, organization that we call the Mexican Restaurant, uh, Kern County Mexican Restaurant Association. There's, about, there's probably about uh, 30 of us uh, with the probably own about 50, 50 Mexican restaurants. And just to give you an idea of how, we, we, how, what we're, how we're thinking now, um, the, uh, the, they all told me one time, you know what, if we're, if we're, what are we paying $1,000 for a, a year? What, uh, what, what is it, what is it get, getting us if the, the health department is not doing nothing? So about four months ago, I had an, uh, a meeting with, uh, with Matt. <laughs> it was funny, you know where I'm going. And I told him, Matt, you know, I was, it was just me there and my, and my brothers. I said, Matt, you know what? All my guys behind me, all of my, our friends that own restaurants are telling me, why should we keep on paying if we're not getting protected? I go, what if we all just decide one year not to pay? What are you going to do? He goes, well, I'll shut you guys down. I go, man, we laughed about it. This is how we get along. We laughed about it. I said, Matt, you can't shut down the fruit vendor on the corner, one little fruit vendor. How are you going to shut down 50 Mexican restaurants? And, uh, and the reason why I had the courage to tell him that is because he had already, him and at that time Donna, which was, uh, that worked with him, um, had already uh, told us, there's nothing we could do about it. We, we, we stop them from doing it, they're there the next day, we go again, they don't have ID, they, 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 they leave, they walk away from the, the, from the stuff, nothing we could do about it. We, can, we can't, I go, why don't you take their, take their uh, equipment? We can't do it. Now we get to the point where maybe we could take their equipment. Now we're at the point where maybe we could, we could make a difference. Now we're at the point that maybe I won't threaten uh, Matt anymore because <laughs> I know he's doing what he needs to do. I know he, he's backing us up. So my second chance up here, there it is, and I really hope you consider this. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Any other comments? Second by the way, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing other comments, I'll return to the board and go to Supervisor Maggard. Thank you. I appreciate you guys coming today, and I enjoy uh, the products that you sell. I'm a, a, a customer of yours. Uh, your, your, the fun, jovial attitude that you have is reflected in your establishments. Uh, you know, it's, you, you make uh, enjoying your food a fun experience as well as a, a good food experience. Uh, I, I want to uh, assure you that I will be supportive of this. I, I, it's my duty to hear the public comment, and I will hear it but I am absolutely inclined to be as supportive as I can of what you're suggesting. Uh, there are two other aspects to this I want to put on the table. One is flower vendors. Uh, I, I don't know to what extent that affects, the, it is affected by the public health department, but we don't know where those flowers came from. We don't know what uh, bugs and insects they bring to us when they come up from Los Angeles and there are those here. We have Asian citrus in our orange trees. We have many other issues, so I would like to coordinate uh, a similar effort to deal with those flower vendors. Uh, the second aspect of this I'd like to bring to the public's attention is uh, I became aware um, some months ago about how very often the person that is on the corner selling the, the fruit drinks or, or the, uh, the flowers is uh, a person that's under the, um, the bondage of human trafficking. They have been dragged up here from Los Angeles. They have been put on that corner 
No one gives them anything to drink. There, it, it is a, a horrible experience for the poor soul that is there selling that. And not only do we need to, to, uh, to make an even playing field so that our, our great community uh, uh, residents and citizens can, can uh, compete effectively uh, to, to services with the great products that they do, uh, but it's a, a, an undeniable shame that we turn our nose and don't, don't pay attention to human trafficking on almost every corner in East Bakersfield where I live. So uh, I am 100% uh, 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 supportive of our efforts to do this, and I'd, I'd like to make sure that we expand it to all the areas we can to, to be done with the scourge of this in our community. Thank you very much for coming today. Is that a motion? Yes. Second. The motion is just to set the, the hearing for Tuesday, October 22nd at 9 a.m. I'm sorry, and to waive the reading, introduce the ordinances, designate County Council as official to prepare notice of public hearing and summary of proposed ordinances and direct the clerk of the board to publish hearing notices and summary of proposed ordinances. That's your motion? Yes. Thank you. Did you second? Um, one, sh one short comment before we vote. I'd like to discuss with you, it sounds like, um, well, I wanna talk to you about your staffing levels, if you're gonna be able to adequately enforce this um, so we can have that conversation at a later date. Thank you. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved. Four ayes, one absent. Supervisor Perez. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. That takes us to item uh, 23, which is a request for auth authorization to purchase healthy snacks in the amount not to exceed $500 and to waive fees for the two-day women's event on September 28th and 29th at Bessie Owens School in North Meadows Park. Mr. Constantine, is this also you? Me. Hi, Bryn. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Bryn Kerrigan. I'm your Assistant Director of Kern County Public Health. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, I would like to start this presentation with a brief video. Thank you. will be diagnosed with breast cancer. We will lose on the average 91 women to this disease. One in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. Put yourself first. I pink I can. 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 Take control of your health by getting clinical breast exams, annual mammograms, and doing regular self breast exams. I am joined this morning by Jennifer Henry, Executive Director with Links for Life, who's here in the audience. As you heard in the video, breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer among women in Kern County, with approximately 500 women being diagnosed each year. More than 90 Kern County women lose their lives to breast cancer each year, and one in eight Kern County women will develop breast cancer at some point during their lifetime. For these reasons, Kern County Public Health Services, Links for Life, and Kern Medical have decided to partner and provide a special Women's Day weekend providing women's health services in Kern County. Women's Day is a two-day event that will be held on September 28th and 29th this year. September 28th will be at Bessie Owens School, and September 29th will be at North Meadows Park. Links for Life is providing free mammograms to women, and Kern Medical is enrolling women in the Every Woman Counts program, along with providing follow-up medical services to all women who have concerns noted during their mammograms. Public Health Services will bring the mobile health unit and will provide all other women's health services, including physical exams, birth control, and STD testing. Kern Medical will also provide child care for the women who are taking advantage of these services. To incentivize Kern County women to take advantage of Women's Day, the department is requesting to purchase healthy snacks for participants and to waive all fees for services provided at Women's Day. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to ask Ms. Henry to come forward and address your board. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see you gentlemen again. So we are very excited. I'm Jennifer Henry, the Executive Director of Links for Life and thank you for seeing me. We are excited to partner with the Health Department and Kerr Medical to do these, what we just decided was a pop-up screening. All this excitement about pop-up clothing, well, why don't we just save our women? 
You know, that's more important than what they wear. So Kern County needs to address breast health. And so with the health department and Kern Medical, we are addressing it and doing it at Bessie Owens and in Oildale. What a better way than to supply these screenings on a weekend when women aren't working, they don't have to take time off work, and then they have child care. So we hope you approve this, and you may stop by between 8 and 3 p.m. at either location. So we'd love to see you come out and visit with us as we help these women. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henry. Any other, are you, does that conclude your presentation? That concludes my presentation. Are there any public comments on this item? Seeing so that I'll return to the board. Motion to approve. Second. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved, four ayes, one absent. Supervisor Perez. Thank you. That takes us to the end of the morning agenda. Just need a motion to adjourn to closed session. Motion. Without objection, we're adjourned. Thank you.